Yeah. Yep. The boots. I hate you guys. He's coming ready for action. What are you laughing at, though? We love it. We're in Florida right here. He's bringing, keeping a country, baby. Oh, man. What's up guys, welcome to our channel again. Today we're here with Josh. You guys have been posting a lot of comments on what videos you guys would like to see and one of them that keeps coming back to us is nitrates and phosphates. A lot of people have trouble dealing with that. It's something that affects your corals a lot, the look of your tank. So I say, why not just park here in front of the Pentagon today and just chit chat a bunch about nitrates and phosphates. So what you got, Josh? A pretty good view. Pretty good view, right? Yeah. It looks beautiful. Yeah. So this thing has been running now for four years and we wanted to just have a little background for you guys to tell you this is one thing perfect to talk about because it's been more than four years. Four and a half years now running. You're right. Four and a half years solid right now. The reason why this tank does so well is a true ecosystem, right? Yeah, for sure. And what would you attribute that to, Josh? I think a lot of the, the stuff in there is really, really mature. All the rocks we had in water for long before we set the tank up the corals that we're putting in here a lot of them came with us from the other store yeah it's and true from the 900 you, know, you can't you can't take that for granted that coral if it was living somewhere else it's coming with a bunch of good habits so to speak right so technically the tank has got more than four and a half years of life yeah kind of like dog I, bet, years. I bet you some of these corals have been around longer than me yeah i'm sure some of this coral, you ain't kidding, buddy. There's definitely a few corals that we have for a very, very long time, you know? There's but a ton of maturity. I mean, the, the sand obviously matures rather quick. And we put all that good established sand underneath the mangrove. I don't know if you remember that. Yes, yes, we did. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a refuge and some different type of mangrove stuff that it did supposed to. Well, we pulled it out of the invert system. But it was something that we did, something, some minerals, something we put in. No, we pulled it right out of the invert system. Is that what it was? Yeah, super dirty, rich sand. Rich sand. Yeah. Well, well, anyways, this tank right here, guys, doesn't have any issues with nitrous and phosphates. And I, 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 I attribute that to, to the uh, how established the tank is. Mm -hmm. uh, it just well, it's just a well ecosystem. The filtration is nothing crazy. It's got a protein scheme that doesn't produce that much. We have a calcium actually, reactor. It actually works terrible. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't <laughs> produce that much. Um, we have a UV sterilizer. We don't have, we, we pull some filter pads on the sump. Yeah, that, for a mechanical, that's really all we use. Is There's a couple pads. of rocks that's still on the sump, but we got rid of them. There's a good few. Yeah, so we got the sand right here. We got a Fiji pink on the bottom, and then we put the grade A from Carib C. That's where you see a lot of coralline growing. But Again, just to talk about this tank, no issues. And other people's tanks, some people have issues. So let's, I'm gonna run some examples. Mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of tank tours lately, right? And we went last May to Ohio and we did mass 200 gallon tank. We're gonna put a little couple clips in there for you guys to remember, you know? A Chester, little, Chester Grove. His tank was, guys, no joke, phenomenal, phenomenal. I mean, so meticulous. The best gonio pores I've ever seen fully open. I mean, his tank was flawless. There's no other mm -hmm. way to put it. His nitrates were zero. His phosphates were zero. Then, if you rewind a month or two before that, I went to see Coralito in South Florida. Mm -hmm. He's got, I want to say, roughly a 200-gallon tank. Beautiful tank. We're going to show you a couple clips. And he wasn't doing water changes, if I remember correctly. And his nitrates were like 50 or 60 in another beautiful tank. So, again, who am I to say that nitrates work nitrates don't work but i've seen where people have more issues by having nitrates than having beautiful tanks so but i've seen the the one off where they know how to manipulate their numbers and how to control the reef because they understand all of the reef in general what's the old saying there's more than one way to skin a cat yeah so i would say reefing is like cooking you can cook rice and beans you can do barbecue in five thousand different ways yep. And that's just the beginning of it. I mean, I'm sure that if you start throwing different ways of doing it, 
you can smoke it, you can put it on a grill. I mean, there's, right, there's a different... I think, I think that's why we do so good here is because we have all these different scenarios and we have to treat each one case by case. So there's no like silver bullet, one size fits all. You can't just go do one thing on every system here and expect it to work the same. It's true, because look, guys, if you guys, you guys are getting to know me through all these videos and I try to keep it very 100% real, I really do. I'm a... I'm a hardcore hobbyist that like to keep it very simple. And Josh has been with us in the company for 12 years now. And when Josh first started with us, when you first started with us, Josh, I remember you wanted to, once you got better at things within two or three years, you're like, hey, Victor, let's try this, let's try that. And I'm very opposite to try new things. Mm -hmm. I like to know the guy that what works, it will take you a very long ways, right? Mm -hmm. And you and me right now, we start riffing together about a year and a half ago, you put an office tank in your office. And I did one and we added frag tanks and we're friendly competing with each other and we support each other. I would say that, right? Yep. Because we really care for each other and we care for the tanks. So we don't reach each other back. We literally, we're, we're in each other's tanks saying, hey, dude, did you notice this? Hey, if you try this, you should try this. Hey, I, we want me to feed your tank. We're literally supporting each other, but we're competing at the same time. Why we're doing that is to try different ways. Yeah. Like me, I refuse to do anything. I'm not doing trace elements. I'm not doing uh, A and B. I mm -hmm. just literally just cog wash it. If it's not enough, get, literally I'm taking water out of my tank, right? Just, just to, to do it, which is not the most recommended thing to do. Yeah, what are, you, what are your recommended nitrate levels? I personally like to keep them anywhere between 10 and 20. Don't go over 30, you're pushing it. You like to keep them at zero. Yeah, I'd rather keep it clean and feed it. That's my control is the food. And cycling, a lot of people say Aikens knee high um, nitrates. Um, people say mushroom knee, oh, they need high phosphorus and nitrates. I Meanwhile, see them, we've I, got Aikens in our two little tanks yeah, over both. there that are the size of a golf ball. Right now, the tank on my office mm -hmm. and your office, they're both reading zero nitrates, mm -hmm. right? I, mine's reading a little bit of phosphate. But magically, your mushrooms are doing 10 times better. Mushrooms are not doing good on my tank. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing they're not doing good. Everything else... Akins, Gunnies, they're back to doing amazing. The Chalices are doing amazing. So that's a good lesson My for, for anybody that's watching this. So quit focus so much on the number. It's probably something to do with the environment. The environment, exactly. Mm -hmm. Is a fish picking at them? Is it too much light? Is it too much flow? Yep. Is it they got nowhere to hang on to? Are there other mushrooms in there that are irritating the ones that you have? Exactly. I mean, people will be amazed about, people think like, oh, mushrooms don't sting each other. You're right, but there's a reason why a mushroom is over, is going to grow faster than the other one is going to be able to overpower it. So they might not sting each other, but they got some, something that they sent. You, you guys know that coral sent a scent, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's I think how they it's control. Aleopathy is the term? I don't know the term, but mm -hmm. I know that they do that, and that's how they're able to just keep controlling how much environment they're going to, how much space they're going to grow on, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like it's kind of like with us. It's a pheromone type thing. You know, there's messages being sent across the tank in a chemical way. So again, <clears throat> Josh is trying different things. He's doing trace elements on his tank. I'm not. Recently, you went feeding as much, and your coals got a little pale. You tried a little mm -hmm. light, right? There's, again, we're keeping it 100 real, guys. Here, yep. we're not perfect here. We try. We're trying to push the boundaries on things. That's why Josh is pushing the lights. That's what I'm trying to do with just with cold water. How far can I get with just cold water? You know. Mm -hmm. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of people says you can only grow so far with Cogwasser. I'm going to debunk that. If you guys seen a video that I did five, six months ago, I went in November to the Long Island Aquarium. I went for a second time. I went diving it with Joe Aiulio. What's up, Joe? I hope you're watching this video. Guys, that guy's maintaining that 20,000 gallon tank with Cogwasser only. Let me repeat that. He's running a 20 gallon tank with Cog. Was 20 only. gallon? No, I'm sorry. 20,000 gallon <laughs> tank with cog water only. Thank you for correcting yeah. me, Josh. It is so impressive. It is not, don't try that at home, guys. The guy's been doing it for a gazillion years. Yep. That aquarium's been running for a very, very long time. Matter of fact, they just redid it. And he told me straight up, he's basically, he's mixing it and dumping it. Yeah, down. a lot of the old school reefers, they mix a slurry and dump it. Me in and tank. Ryan, when you first start working mm -hmm. for us, what do we used mm -hmm. to do at night? For sure, every night. We used to get the barrel like nice milky right into mm -hmm. the overflow just to keep up with the demand, guys, you know? So, again, there's so many different ways of doing it. And going, I'm not trying to get off topic here, but I was talking about 
how this is different. Coralito did it different. Matt did it different in, in Ohio, right? I mean, there's so many. He's trying a different approach to it. I'm trying a different approach. And again, there's so many different ways to do it. But how much do you learn when you try something new? A lot. I mean, I don't a mean lot. to sound stupid, and I know that messes with the stability of the tank, but every time you try something new on an environment that's otherwise seemingly stable, it's a good control. Yes. So, so if, if this tank is stable and we never have changes and we only make one change, we're pretty sure that whatever the outcome is, is the result of that change. Yes. You know, so a lot of times trying something new is a good thing as long as you have a stable environment to place it in. Yeah, it's funny you say that because when you first start trying to change things like seven, eight years ago around in the tanks, uh, I, one of the things I told you, I said, Josh, I don't mind changing things, but I want to try one thing very slow. Mm -hmm. So we can see the result, just like you're saying. And that's our motto, guys. At home, too many people, they say to us, matter of fact, the customer come to, to me the other day and says, oh man, uh, I don't know what's going on with the tank and um, what have you changed? Nothing. I start asking things and magically he goes, oh, I start doing the, um, the moonshine method. And I go, what do you mean you haven't changed anything? You went from doing water changes, now you're not doing water changes and you're do dosing all these bacteria and these different liquids and mm -hmm. this, excuse me if I sound stupid, but I'm not into those methods, so I don't know every single thing that they dose. I really, to me, I'm not into it. And guess what? Josh says, you know what? I'm going to start diving a little bit into this bacteria. He's trying to test it on one tank just to play around. There's nothing wrong. Before, guys, we were all about just sand over the bottom. Now we're trying a lot of different medias. He tried on his, on his tank. He tried the reborn media. I tried the smaller size of the reborn media. We used to use on, on sand, nothing back in the days. We used to use the Fiji pink. Now we use different types just to try different things. So trying different things is nothing wrong with it, but do one thing at a time. So if you want to control your phosphorus and nitrates, don't go around, oh, I have a problem with nitrous and phosphates, and the first thing that you're going to do is like, let me go fix it. No, guys. Let's talk about how can you fix some of these things. Let's talk about nitrous. You can fix your nitrous by a giant water change. Mm -hmm. Wait, hang on a second. Nitrates are, just for really basic terminology, nitrate and phosphate is the result of an organic buildup in your aquarium. Unprocessed waste. Mm -hmm. Is there that right? Very, well... So, so nitrate is like processing waste out. Okay. Right? If you think about nitrifying bacteria, its purpose is to break down those organics. Okay. Phosphate is always the result of a food or something foreign going into the tank. So if you have elevated phosphate levels, it's because you are physically doing it. Yes. That's a fact. Yes. Okay, so it's either going in by, by way of your water, your source water, or it's going in by way of food, well, almost Always. Since you said that, let's debunk something real quick. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say that, oh, what if my rocks are <coughs> leaching phosphate? Or what about my old tank used to have, there used to be phosphates on the tank, leaching phosphates. I feel like maybe on rocks, I'm not too sure I shouldn't, I shouldn't give my opinion because I don't know enough about that specific aspect. But when people say that it's leaking out of your old glass, it's not enough for you to get no. readings into your If tank. glass was that porous, it would leak. Yeah. Like, there's a tank that we're getting ready to do. We're, we're going to let the cat out of the bag down the road. We got a little content coming for you guys. The fish only that we have behind mm -hmm. the counter, we're going to turn into a reef tank. We're just not fish people. We're just not fish people. They, the fish are doing amazing, mm -hmm. but we just need more space for corals, and we just love corals, and we're going to turn into a coral tank. Mm -hmm. However, that tank has got medicines before yep. and many, copper. Many different medicines. And we don't care. We, matter of fact, we're going to use the same rocks, guys, mm -hmm. just to debunk the process. So if you're out there believing that, oh, I cannot use those rocks, I cannot use that, we don't believe in that. But again, we might be wrong, but what better than just to try it and see if it works, right? We'll but make it work. Going back at it, different ways how to get rid of your nitrous and phosphates. Mm -hmm. Let's just start with nitrous. You can use a denitrif um, denitrification. Um, um, well, there's the old school towers. Yeah. You remember, you see the, the big trickle towers. Yeah. That's a denitrator. Denitrator. That's what I was trying yep. to say. Denitrator, basically. There's sulfur denitrators. Sulfur denitrators. Mm -hmm. You can do a giant water changes. Mm -hmm. You can clean the crap out of your sand. Yep. If it's bare bottom, you can move some rocks that you might think they're cleaning. You're going to have giant packets up there and get rid of that. Yeah. It's stuff. It's waste. Yeah. Adding bigger filter socks. I'm so, saying like, so technically what you're doing is you're getting that waste out of the water. Physically. Mm -hmm. Physically getting that waste. Getting the roller mat to, to make sure it's working 24-7. Mm -hmm. Crank your skimmer up. Upsize the size of your protein skimmer. 
And why do I always talk about flow? Because in those pockets where there's tons of waste, if you can go in the rocks and go like this and a big plume of crap comes up out of the rocks, that means your flow is not getting it up into the water column. So what? Your skimmer, your filter floss, your socks, your roller mat can actually take it out of the water. So column. there you go. So adjusting your flow, <clears throat> as to get, it has to get to the sump. All right. So so that's another one too. No 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 two tanks are always alike. So all these things mm -hmm. that we're telling doesn't mean that it works for everyone. Why are we saying that? Let's say this is my tank at home. I have a 1,200 gallon lagoon tank, and let's just say right now, for some reason I got no fret tanks attached to it. And I, this just looks like this. And George has the same tank at home, but he's got six frag tanks attached to it. And he's got half of the amount of corals and half of the corals. And he's got one overflow box instead of two. So his tank drains different. Yep. He's got less waste. He's got more water volume. If I've got six frag tanks, I've got additional impacts aside from what the Yeah, what's his bio low versus mine? So it's not as simple as... Two tanks, are, it's very difficult to treat two tanks always exactly the same. Wow, I just had like a brain What fart. do you have? A 1,200-gallon lagoon, you just said. You've got one and I've got one? That's kind of hardcore. Well, we should put one in the <laughs> bag eventually. No, you just said you have a 1,200-gallon lagoon at home. And I started thinking about how would that be. Sorry. I mean, I'm dreaming to have a big tank at home <laughs> one of these days, you know? We're going crazy around here. If, but, but anyhow, guys, so... Those are the ways to, to get rid of uh, um, nitrates. Phosphates, go ahead. What do you like? How do you like to get rid of phosphates, Josh? Phosphates, if, if it's really elevated, that means that we weren't testing properly. Okay. Because it doesn't just happen overnight. And then if it's really elevated, I'll use something like ROA, which is pretty subtle. It's not really super abrasive like the high capacity GFO. So put in like a media reactor? <clears throat> I don't prefer a reactor because that's so abrasive. abrasive. I'd rather put it in a sock. In yeah. a sock, there is, so let me explain to people what the difference is between the sock and a reactor. In a reactor, you're forcing uh, the water to go, whatever water you choose, the amount of volume that you choose to go through there, it goes 100% through there versus in a sock, it just kind of like touches it, but it's a little more gentle way of yeah, doing it. You're not forcing it by pressure. It's an efficiency thing. It's more efficient through a reactor, so it's going to work better. It's less efficient through a sock, so it's not going to work as good. But I kind of like that more subtle approach because it's not going to just drop the phosphates out. Right. So raw phos, mm -hmm. water changes is another one, diluting the water, obviously. Either change the type of food that I'm feeding or reduce the amount of feeding okay. because eventually it'll come down okay, unless we'll it's like... Okay, another one that I like is a product from Brightwell, um, Brightwell Aquatics. It's called phosphate E. It's basically a chemical that you put in the cup with your protein skimmer and it binds the phosphates together and it mm. spits them out, right? Is that the best way to explain it? Yeah, I believe the way that it works is it binds, it uses a uh, carbonate source as an aggregate. So it, it binds those ions together and it falls out and becomes an inert material in your water column. Yeah, we used that product before. It works amazing. <coughs> just make sure you don't overdose it. If you overdose it, it is just attaches to your glass and mm -hmm. it becomes one of the biggest nightmares to get rid of it. It, is, it. it can be to the point where you can stain the glass where it will never come off again. It works really good. Um, C clear is another form of that. Okay. It's uh, lanthanum chloride. Lanthanum chloride, okay. Mm -hmm. Any other ways you like to get rid of phosphates? That's really That's it. My, my preferred method is slow down on the feeding and use roll of phos. And some foods are known for carrying more, more phosphates than others, I noticed. Yeah. Any, any food that's really, really rich for your corals. So if it's like awesome food, chances are it's high in phosphate. Yeah, I noticed because when I get happy feeding on my tank, my mm -hmm. phosphate go up. But I want, dude, guys, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pro feeder. Like, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I don't think many people feel like I do. I'm, like, every time you see me feeding, don't try that at home because your tank is going to crash within a month. No. Seriously, you got to be ready to understand. You got to observe your tank a lot. You got to test your tank a lot. You got to make sure your skimmer's cranking. You got to make sure you're doing heavy water changes. If you're feeding heavy. If you're and, feeding heavy. and then you go on the other side of the coin, like me, if I get busy with life, things happen, I'm not taking, taking care of my tank the way that I'm supposed to, I don't need that extra filtration. I don't need to keep up on all that stuff that you're talking about. Why? Because I'm not putting it in. It's not high performance at that point. Gotcha. You know? So if you guys have any questions throughout this video, 
please post them in the comments below. We really like to engage with you guys. We have a team that takes care of that. A lot of those questions, they're a little complex. They come back to me and Josh and they ask us. So it's me and Josh Warren Bolt. We read a lot of the comments. We're very passionate, believe it or not. We're in there just grinding it. So don't be shy. Just post those comments below, you know. Also, if you're planning to come for Reef of Palooza on April 20 and 21st, it happens to be 10 minutes from us. We have a booth set up at the show. I'm going to be at the show the whole weekend. Josh is going to be here at the store the whole weekend. Grab either of us. Just shoot a question to us. We'll give you a few minutes of our time. We're here to support the hobby, you know. We want the hobby to grow. No question is too stupid, so don't feel silly. Approach us. We'd love to shake your hand, you know, and just chat with you about your reef tank. And that's how we come up with some of this content is it becomes discussion over and over and over yeah. again. If it shows up in the comment section, it's probably worth a video, right? And by, yeah, and by discussing these this, this topics with people, we'll be surprised how much we learn from you guys as well. When I go to these, these tank tours, I'm always picking little little things here and there. When somebody comes over and they show me a picture, be like, oh, I did this and I had this problem. It might let me to think of another problem solving. So the more we talk and the more we engage in, in different people and different different dilemmas that they present mm -hmm. to us, the more it gets our brains engaged, right? That's Yeah, I didn't like doing these videos at first. And I'm kind of glad that you wrote me into it eventually. Because it's not I, easy. Well, I started getting used to it. I hate it, it too. And you know what? One of my favorite parts about working in the retail store is when people bring in water samples. Gotcha. I can read through all the BS, right? If you bring me a water sample over and over again, I can tell you well, you're, you're probably going. full of BS somewhere or you didn't tell the whole truth there. But the cool part about these videos is all that stuff that I learned over the years doing water test and coaching people into success. I don't get to do it with just one person. I get to do it with a whole bunch of viewers at one time. Yeah, and it's just, you know what, it's, it's funny you say that because I had a few instances when people come to me and they say, Victor, you have no idea. I follow your method that you did this. I follow your way of cleaning. I use your razor blade. I folded the algae how you told me to. Oh, I didn't do this. So I didn't change things like I thought I used to change things too much. Or I used the keep it simple method that you use, Victor. And people, if people are telling me genuinely or people that I grab here in the retail store, sometimes I run into customers and I'm able to help them. And I tell them, look, if I was in your shoes, I will do this. I will do that. I will do one, two, three. And I run into them a year later, six months later on the next Reef of Palooza next year. And they go, Victor, you have no idea. My tank turned around so much. And I'm like, I don't think people listen to what we're saying, but I guess they are, you know, to us. We're humble people. We just believe ourselves as hardcore hobbies, just like you guys. And we just happen to do this full time for a very long time. And it's just, we're glad to pass this information to you guys, you know? So Josh, you got anything else you'd like to bring to people on nitrous and phosphates? I think the biggest thing is just understanding that that's not like calcium and alkalinity. You know, you're putting those materials into your water column because the corals need them. And nitrate and phosphate is, it's important. It needs to be there. It's in the wild, but it's in small proportion. So balance is everything. As long as we don't have too much of something, and when we're talking about waste like nitrate and phosphate, as long as it's not too much, a little bit is enough, okay. right? So, so it's all about how high performing the tank is. If there's a ton of coral, like this tank, there's not as much water volume here as there is coral, right? Yeah. So we can probably feed a lot more here, yeah. right? Sure. And it can probably process that waste out a lot better than if there was no coral in here, right? Yeah. So now take an aquarium that's this big, you know, our average new coming hobbyist, it's building a 20 or a 30 gallon tank. They've got brand new Marco rock, brand new sand. How much waste can that tank really process? Are you, are you talking about me? I'm not shooting a year arrows ago? here. Are you talking about a year no, ago I'm, my I'm tank? I'm not firing shots. <laughs> I'm just saying, but it's yeah. true. That's what happened to me. Funny enough, you say that. I, like, we, we brought this topic up before, it's not new, but again, mm -hmm. you guys don't watch every single video, there's always new people jumping in. Josh started his tank a year and a half ago, I roughly, we do, we started both a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and Josh decided to start with fully cure rock and fully cure uh, reborn media, and I had the great idea to start with brand new reborn media and brand new marker rocks. Six months into it, Josh was growing aquaporous. Six months into it, I was still trying to figure out how not to kill fish. So my tank couldn't process waste. It took a very yeah. long time to get that done. It, yeah. it wasn't easy. Josh, one thing that we haven't covered in this video. Talk to me about, we did sell nitrates. Ideally, you, look, if you're a new hobbyist, aim always to stay under 10. If That's a good mark. Whatever that number is. 10 on nitrates, you're pushing it, okay? <clears throat> For new hobbyists, if you don't mm. know what you're looking at. If you go and you go to your fish store and you test the water and they say your nitrates are eight or 10, 
chances are you're pushing a little too 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 hard get you do the things that we told you earlier apply any of those things mm -hmm. get those nitrates down phosphates what numbers you like to stay at josh i like under 0 0.1 0 0.1 not 0 0.01 under okay. 0 0.1 okay so and the reason the reason why i feel like that's important is because any kind of manipulation or any kind of margin of error in testing is going to read you maybe 0 0.03 or 0 0.05. There's a little bit of range there. Okay. So as long as it's 0.1 or under, it's going to be good. As soon as you start getting over that 0.1 range, it's kind of like, I better I start taking the action. the 0 0.08 is the magic. Is that the, the one? Yeah. If you go over 0.1, you, you, chances are you pushed it too far. Yep. Ideally, if you're staying on the 0 0.08, it, that means you're good. Don't even overlook that. Mm -hmm. Couple other things. Can you tell me what ways you like to measure this? What are your preferred methods, your preferred test kits? So all, all the hobbyist grade test kits, whether it be Salifer, whether it be um, HANA, whether it be the Red Sea test kits, they all have different ways of testing. Stick with the same one. That's all that matters. Okay. HANA works great. It's a good finite number but it still has a margin of error. Okay. The Red Sea test, the Salford test, when you're reading a color, just keep using the same one. It really doesn't matter what Yellow's you use. Tank, because Yellow's has one as well. Yeah, I, I, Lamont makes a good test kit. You know, Hawk makes a professional test kit. What about kit. that new wheel that I've been going that went to uh, Ivan from Jungle <coughs> Boys? I did a tank uh, last August when I was in Southern California. The been something or another. Yeah, right? also I went to this yeah. a video that is about It's an to API come product. Yeah, there's a new one that is coming out. It's a new video uh, named, a gentleman named Dalton that we made in Louisiana. Cool guy, beautiful tank by the way, new hobbyist. He's got one of those too. So we should get one of those to start playing with it just a little bit. Yeah, so they all work. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Stick gotcha. with something that, that you enjoy. If it doesn't take you a long time and it doesn't feel like a burden to do, use it. And how often do you recommend to test for nitrous and phosphates? Every week. Every week. Okay. And for someone... You know, hang on a second. The reason why I say every week is because if it changes that much in one week, you're going too far with it. Okay, gotcha. Now, what visual signs can you see when you see nitrates? For me, when I'm thinking about nitrate, I'm looking at how fast the film on the glass develops. Okay. So if it gets really dusty in a single day, I feel like my nitrates are on the rise too fast. Okay. Um, Phosphate is the same thing? When it comes to phosphate, I always look at like Acropora because they'll start to darken over time, but that doesn't happen in a week. So lack of growth tips in Acropora or if you have any kind of stony, so a Monty, you get that nice white rim on it when it's growing good. Acros, nice growth tip. Digi, that nice fat gotcha. oval kind of tip on it. Any stony is going to show you whether the phosphates are high or not. Because okay. if they're not white and they're not blue, in, in you know some case, if you run the lights really blue, the tips and they don't look white; they look blue. Gotcha. Um, but if they're not there, they're not growing well. Okay. Well, one thing that I'm sure you guys are wondering what's going on. You guys see these two racks full of aquaporas here? Well, you guys been wondering what's going on with the 4,000 gallon tank. It is almost, almost done. Uh, we're finishing shooting in about three days. We're going to finish the last shooting of the 4,000 gallon tank. Those aquaporas, they've been there quarantining for two months. We dip them three times per week. We're overkill making sure we didn't introduce any flatworms. They've been super clean, but we just... We just you overdo diligent to make sure that they're going clean. So be on the lookout for the 4,000 gallon update. If you happen to be here on Rifapalooza weekend, you definitely want to come and check out this tank. It's looking amazing. We're finishing the drywall. The sump is in play. The protein scheme is running. The mm -hmm. lights are turning on. Yep. We're working on the controller. We're working on a bunch of other things. Any questions you guys regarding that, just go ahead and shoot questions to Josh when you come here. It's worth to come and see it. It's gigantic. It's what a monster, you know? Feels huge. Feels huge. Yeah, I mean, when you have a 1,500-gallon tank and that dwarfs it, yeah, it's pretty huge. All right, Josh, thank you for your time, bro. Awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. We put a lot of effort into explaining these things to you guys, teaching you guys at home. Hopefully, you guys get to grow with this hobby with us, you know. Again, don't forget to subscribe, give us a like, post some comments below. We'll see you guys on the next episode. See you guys.